Sarah Henson Young. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So multiculturalism is back, or the term is back. Do we need these sorts of definitions to uh, explain to the country what we're on about? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think when you talk to people on the street, and particularly if somebody of my generation, we've always believed that we are a multicultural community. We, we know what that means. It's respecting each other. It's the vibrancy of our communities. Um, what has failed here is the political discourse around it and leadership. And of course, you know, it's a, it's been a wonderful to see the Labor Party readopt the, the M word. Um, what we now need to see is, is what that means in terms of supporting those communities and, and really uh, making sure it's not just a part of our education system, but that we just accept that multiculturalism is mainstream. We're a multicultural community, we're a multicultural society, and that's what makes Australia great. And uh, when you look back in history, we always have been, we will continue to be, and let's, let's be proud of that. So where did it go? Why was the government reluctant to use the term for so long and certainly during the election campaign? Yeah, look, it's, um, I think it's really about a failure of political leadership for the, particularly the last decade. And uh, we saw the, uh, you know, the cultural wars and the history wars and um, people wanting to make mileage for their own political gain out of this. But I think the community and uh, people who, who, who you know, go about their everyday business, it was never a problem for them. It's, mm. uh, it's political leadership that's been the problem. Well, let's talk about this nine year old uh, orphan boy described by one lawyer this week as a ping pong ball. Um, what did you make of the government's handling of that? I think the government's handling of um, uh, Sina's case, in particular the, the nine year old boy that you talk about, was was a debacle to say the least. You know, this is, this is a young boy who uh, the day after the tragedy when we learnt that he had become um, orphaned because he'd lost both of his parents, uh, I came out clearly and said to the minister, uh, this boy along with the other orphans, along with the other survivors should be brought to the mainland because because we know these people are going to be suffering above and beyond the normal trauma of asylum seekers who have fled persecution and torture. This awful incident compounding um, that, uh, that stress and that, that traumatic uh, experience that they've been through, bring them to the mainland so they're close to services. And we knew that a number of these people had extended family here uh, in New South Wales. So uh, let's, let's try and do the logical thing and take a, a common sense approach. That was rejected. We now see this boy uh, caught up in, in what it has really been a political game this week. I don't think anyone wants to see another week that we saw, uh, both from the opposition, of course, and also from the government. I don't think it was mm. a particularly high point for any of them. But then this case got a lot of attention, but there are, what, something like 1,000 kids in detention? There's, there's 1,065 kids in detention to date. And, um, of course, when we saw Chris Bowen make uh, the minister make announcements in October around the need to try and move children out of detention, there's just over 600. So since October to now... The those numbers have risen. And uh, while there's been a commitment to enact the, the, uh, the, the power that the Minister already has, has had since 2005, to uh, make a discretion to allow children and their families to, to move out, uh, it's definitely not happening as fast as it should be. So, so what should be done? Well, look, I think we need to fast track the process and get those kids and their families out of detention. That's an absolute must. But we also need to fix things for the longer term. How come we've got to a stage where there's a thousand kids in detention? You know, regardless of what people's political opinions on this issue is in terms of the, the overall strategy of dealing with asylum seekers and, and the various different visa applications and processes, uh, most people that you would talk to on the street. Most parliamentarians would argue that kids do not believe, belong in detention. And if we believe that, well, let's do something to fix it. And that means we actually have to amend the Migration Act. And how would you go about doing that, though? You, you've got in mind a, um, a, an inquiry, a six-month inquiry. What I really want to see the government do is uh, acknowledge that we need to fix this, not just uh, in terms of the kids that are there now, but that we don't want to have to go back to, to a situation where we have a backlog of a 1,000 children held... Uh, in immigration detention. So a review commissioned by the government to independently uh, analyse the Migration Act and how it interacts with responsibilities of government to minors and children get some recommendations from the experts who know about this. People have been talking about this for a long time and yet it's falling on the deaf ears of government. Let's get some recommendations and then as parliamentarians sit around the table and work out how we can agree 
that kids don't belong in detention and what we're going to do to make sure that is the law. Have you spoken to anybody in the government about this? Is there any appetite for such an approach? Look, I've, I've mentioned it to, uh, to, to the Minister and I've asked for further talks on, on this issue. I think it's something that the government seriously needs to consider. Does Chris Bowen really want to go back <laughs> and have a week that we've just seen? You know, the, low, the lowest point in, in the debate over this issue was, was last week. And uh, if Chris Bowen wants to fix this for the long term, if we want a common sense approach and a humane approach, something that really does ensure that we, we respect the compassion and empathy that really underpins Australian values, then, then this, I think this is a wise decision to take. If you talk to politicians, though, on both sides in, in the major parties, you talk to them privately and they say, but this, this concern comes up wherever, wherever we go. People are really concerned about asylum seekers and so they simply won't go into bat for them. Look, it's, it's really interesting that the, the politics that came out this week, I mean, really grubby, yucky stuff that we, that we saw, comments that were made about uh, really underscoring uh, and uh, really going to the, the base level of, of, of what's existing in every society. But politicians who play on that, I think, uh, uh, really lack the leadership that, that their position deserves. And uh, what we saw was politicians play to that, rather than saying, hang on a minute, the Australian community are a compassionate bunch. You know, we have this innate uh, belief in the fair go. That's what we were built on. That's what, why people want to come to our countries. I, have, I, I find it extraordinary that we have this debate about border protection. You know, people who, who come to Australia as asylum seekers, seeking protections, don't want to break our borders. They want to be invoked by the protection of our borders. That's why they're coming here. And uh, it's, it's a shift, of course. It means putting the politics aside for a minute and putting the people at the centre. And that hasn't happened for a long time in the Australian uh, political sphere on this issue, and it's time it did. OK, I want to ask you about the flood levy now, and uh, you managed to... Uh to reverse $100 million uh, that the government had given up on the, uh, on the solar flagship uh, program. Uh, that's a shortfall now that the government will have to find. Have, have they given you any indication uh, how they'll do that? Well, look, our, in our negotiations and discussions with the government, it was um, clearly said that this couldn't just come from other service cuts. We don't want to see that happen. Uh, the government is going to have to find other ways to do it. We've got some ideas of, of how that could be done. Uh, an extra $100 million coming from the carbon and uh, capture storage program, that's a place that, that, could, that it could come from. Uh, the government, my understanding, uh, is that they will look at this in the context of, of designing the budget and uh, yeah, the government themselves has said there's other places there. We just don't want to see that come but, from but essential services. did they say services. to you that they won't come from essential services? Well, that, that is what we've put to the government. You, you and put we that to them. So, so what if, uh, okay, you win this concession but then they do something that's just as objectionable to you mm. in the budget? Well, of course, with the budget we will continue to, to scrutinise and look at the budget and look at places where it, if, if indeed it needs to be improved, just like we do, we do every year. We're not interested in knocking and blocking like Tony Abbott, uh, you know, Dr No on the run. This is more about saying, OK, are there going to be areas in the budget that uh, the government maybe doesn't get it right? Or maybe they do and we, we need to in, uh, support that and increase that and improve it. It's about doing it responsibly, though. And until we've got the budget, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to be looking at the crystal ball. But, but how do you do that? Because you say you won't block the budget. So how, how will you influence individual measures? Well, just as we do every year, the, the various different parts of uh, legislation that come through, the discussions and negotiations that we have about improving things. We've done that for, for the 12, 13 years the Greens have been in the Federal Parliament and we'll continue to do that. OK, BHP Billiton uh, announced a profit uh, this week of $10 billion. At the same time, Treasury uh, uh, revealed that the government had given up about $60 billion in its... Uh, and it's compromised with the mining companies on the super profits tax. Do you feel you can now go in even harder on the companies when you negotiate a, a, the, the, carbon, uh, the carbon price with the government? Well, look, I think those figures that were released this week really do uh, put in context the, uh, the, the current deal that's been struck between the government and the three biggest mining companies. I mean, $6 billion the Australian public should be getting um, extra into, uh, to whether that to be put into a sovereign fund, as many uh, economists are now are Arguing. That's what the Greens said from the beginning. Uh, I do think we need to, to have a rethink about the way the mining tax has been structured and uh, how that interacts with uh, the carbon price. Well, 
that's of course still a, a discussion that's happening within the multi-party committee. So, so you see a link between the two, you think your hand has been strengthened as a result of the, the figures that have been disclosed this week? Well of course the, car, the, uh, the need to put a price on carbon and we want to see that happen as, as soon as possible, mm -hmm. the interim carbon price and we've put forward a, a solution that, to the committee and the committee is going to continue having that discussion but of course this issue of the mining tax it does need to be reconsidered now in the context of, remember not even 12 months ago these big companies uh, were crying poor and now we see huge profit uh, predictions being reported. I think it's time for us to have a rethink. But you, you're pretty much in agreement with the government about how this should be applied, are you not? The, the, it seems as if the difficulties will be in terms of how you compensate industry. Well, look, that's obviously going to be a, a key difference of discussion on, in, in terms of the carbon price, yeah. and uh, that's, that's something for the, the committee to keep discussing. And I'm confident that we will get a result. I'm confident that uh, we can work out a way to put an interim price on, on carbon and start to really make a difference to reducing carbon emissions. That's what, that's what this is all about, and uh, I'm confident that the committee will deliver. And just finally, do you ever see the day when the Greens might think again about nuclear power, given that it is one of the cleanest energy sources available? Look, I think the Greens' position on nuclear power is, is quite clear, and uh, I think the Australian people are quite clear that, that they don't want it uh, here in Australia. I realise it's, it's going to be put squarely on the agenda of the, the Labor Party conference, and, and that's an issue for them to talk about. But when there are alternatives that are um, right there, right now, ready to go, they just need the confidence and backing from government, why not be putting our energies into those? Why not put this on the table as well, given that it is a clean source of power? Well, of course, what do you do with the waste, Barry? And that's always the big question. Who, all those um, proponents of, of nuclear power can never answer the questions of what you do with the waste and, of course, how you resist the, uh, the temptation of that further expansion of uranium going into to weapons. And uh, that's, they're not things that can simply be brushed aside in this debate. They're very fundamental and core if Australia was to expand those types of operations. So nuclear power never, ever? Well, look, it's, there's, I haven't seen anyone come up with a solution of how we deal with the waste. And until we do, um, I don't think it's something we should be spending too much time on because there are alternatives uh, that are out there. The uh, solar and uh, uh, thermal industries are, are, are right there ready to go. They just need the backing from government and some real certainty. Now, what we've seen over the last uh, three or four years from this government is um, while they talk about it a lot, there's that boom-bust, boom-bust kind of uh, inference to the the industry and it's time we actually gave them the real backing they deserve. Thanks for your time this morning. Thanks Barry.